Hello, fellow educators. My name is Michael Town, and I am an instructional coach at Bethune Elementary School here in Valverde Unified School District. Um, I've been teaching for 20 years, and I've taught every grade level from um, fourth grade through graduate school, and uh, spent a dozen years teaching secondary at high school level, and uh, as have taught in a variety of situations. But today I'm going to talk to you about one of my research uh, focuses, which is uh, critical discourse analysis, specifically how to develop discourse with young students or uh, teenage students. So first I wanna just quickly define for us what we mean by discourse or what I'm going to be talking about when I talk about discourse. So discourse is gonna come in two different types. I'm gonna call the first one uppercase D discourse and the second one I'll call lowercase d discourse. So uppercase d discourse is the kind of discourses that we engage in as a society or as a member of society. So let me give you a for example. In our society, if you're generally aware of what's going, in, going on in contemporary American society, you will be aware that there is a discourse around guns rights. So what I mean by that is on one side of the discourse, there are people who say, I have a constitutional right to keep and bear arms for the protection of myself, my family, and my country. Those are Second Amendment people who point to the Second Amendment of the Constitution and proclaim that that is a constitutional right of theirs. They tend to be people who are either hunters or people who live in rural areas or people who just believe in self-protection. On the other side of that argument are people who are against um, uh, free use or free access to guns for everybody. And their specific concerns tend to be uh, they would like to limit access to high-powered weapons, especially automatic weapons, or what they call assault rifles. They believe that assault rifles in the wrong hands lead to things like mass shootings. They also believe that uh, the government has a, um, has a duty to protect its citizens by controlling who has access to those guns, especially criminals or people who have been convicted of a crime or people uh, who have had their rights taken away by some court. Uh, they also think in general that um, uh, more guns in society makes society more dangerous. All right, though I've outlined the basics of both sides of that discourse. I'm not advocating for one or the other. I'm just pointing out that you're all probably aware of that, what I'm gonna call uppercase D discourse. It is a discourse that most adults who are aware of things in this country, in contemporary United States, are aware that that, um, that controversy is going on. There is a national discourse around that. Another example might be, for example, abortion rights. Most of you are probably aware of one side of abortion rights versus the other side of abortion rights. And some people call themselves right to life groups, and some people call them um, um, abortion rights or women's rights groups. Okay, which side of the discourse you're on? I'm not discussing that right now. What I am saying is that you are probably aware of that discourse. Those are large national discourses. And the fact that you know about them shows that they are largely socially constructed. And by that, I mean people who live in Georgia are aware of them, people who live in Washington are aware of them, and people who live uh, here in Southern California are probably aware of them if they have um, an awareness of national news or national um, communication. And most adults do, not all, but most. So that's what I'm gonna call an upper D discourse. And where you are on each of those stances helps to define who you are. Um, many people will call themselves a right to lifer, or they'll call themselves a guns rights person. They'll say that, and when they say that, they are taking on a membership in a group of people who all share common thoughts or common ideas or uh, common beliefs, or maybe what they would call common values. All right, uh, my purpose here is not to say one is right versus the other, which is wrong. My purpose here is to say 
that those discourses exist. We are aware of them and how we discuss them and how we define ourselves according to those discourses is largely how we define ourselves. All right. There can be far more specific discourses. So, for example, um, there are people who believe in strong forest management to help uh, humans manage forests and make sure that the health of the forest increases or improves. And those people understand um, certain discourses like around water management or the use of water. And some people might be for more water, water management and some might be for more water usage. And I'm going to say that those are more specific kinds of discourses and who might engage in those. Um, perhaps forest service uh, managers or possibly um, corporations that want to use water. There could be a lot of different interest groups there. But my main point is that how you decide which discourses to engage with partially defines the kind of person you are. So who you are largely depends or at least partially depends on the kinds of discourses that you identify with and choose to engage in. So now I've described upper uppercase D discourses. Okay, I'm going to talk about lowercase d discourses now. And lowercase d discourses are anytime humans communicate using what I'm going to call semiotic devices. And a semiotic device is any, any systematic way that we use to communicate meaning. So most commonly, that's letters, words, symbols, um, written documents, um, numbers, mathematical symbols, um, um, pictures, um, uh, diagrams, uh, anything that one group of people assigns meaning to and another group of people interprets. So, for example, a book is can be a part of a lowercase d discourse. When I read the book, I, 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 I am now getting information from the author of that book. I'm constructing that information. I could have a lower D discourse by having a discussion with somebody, my teacher or my student or even my um, significant other or a friend or just the person that I met at Stater Brothers. Um, I can have a lower D discourse with anybody in any form and that it could include uh, posting a post on a sub uh, a subreddit. It could include posting something on my Facebook page. It could include posting a video on TikTok. It could be anything, to be honest, where I am trying to communicate information with a person or group of people, whether I know that person or group of people or not. Lowercase d discourses uh, can in, be engaged in by people in the same room, people across the planet because we have the internet, or even people across the planet without the internet. For example, if you write letters to each other. I know that's an old-fashioned way of doing it, but what I'm pointing out is that existed even hundreds of years ago. We can have lowercase d discourses even with people who are no longer alive. Um, by that, I mean I could read a book by an author who is who has died in the past and yet his or her words live on in the present. All right. Why is lowercase d discourse so important? I'm proposing, well, uppercase d discourse is super important because it is one of the ways that we define our identity. It is who we are. And if people ask who I am, I would say to them, well, I'm a teacher. I'm an instructional coach. I'm a uh, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a, uh, you know, a friend, I'm many things, but these are the ways that I define who I am. And I may even say things about whether I am a guns rights advocate or whether I'm a, um, a women's rights advocate. I could say those things and then that would give you a sense for who I am. 
Um, often people will say, well, I like to travel. And so you then get a sense for this person. You would interpret that as, oh, this is perhaps an adventurous person or maybe a person with money. I'm not sure how you would interpret that. But the ways in which we identify with certain discourses like world travel or I'm a foodie because I subscribe to the Food Network and I seek out unique um, culinary uh, experiences. You know, these are the kind of discourses that I engage in. I can describe food to you in ways that other people maybe couldn't. So that that makes me a certain kind of person. Uh, maybe I would say I'm a vegetarian. Again, uh, these are the kind of upper D discourse ways that I will define my identity. But lower D discourse is perhaps um, as important in this respect. It is the way that humans learn. I want to say that again. The way that humans learn is through lower D discourse. Um, all of you, because you're all teachers, that means all of you have uh, degrees, perhaps advanced degrees. You know that you went through some systematic processes to learn. Um, and all of those processes in, involved discourse. You may have written essays for your professors. You may have engaged in debates in class. You may have talked over your homework with your fellow classmates. There were many ways that you engaged in discourse. And, uh, and, uh, and you've all gone to university, so you know all those many possible ways. Even just sitting around in the student union was a form of discourse. Um, so uh, your brain over the course of years changed due to those discourses. And I'm talking about a physiological change. The myelination around your neurons thickened. They physically changed. The connections between dendrites increased both in complexity and in number. And so that's a physiological change in your brain. Discourse, the small d discourse that I'm talking about, is the way that we change our brains. It's at a brain science level. It's what teachers are referring to when they say learning. So if lowercase d discourse is the way that humans learn, and by the way, I'm proposing it's the only way that humans learn, and we have students in our classes who are resistant to lower D discourse, then you can see the problem. <laughs> you all know the problem. You've lived it. And so I hope uh, during these ac this activity to help you understand one way to engage in a beginning sequence of discourse. All right. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I look forward to meeting each and every one of you. Thanks again.